Good morning. It is so good to see all of you here um, on this Palm Sunday. I can't believe we're at Palm Sunday to see all of you here um, worshiping with us on this Sunday morning. I love the fact that all of you have chosen in the midst of this nor'easter that we're all experiencing today, that in the wetness of outside, you came to want to be in the warmth of our church. And so welcome to our community. To those that are watching our services online, we thank you so much that you're part of our St. John the Divine family. We say this all the time, but there are, some, there are just so you all know here in, in person, there are by, by far more people who tune into our services all around the world than are here in church on a Sunday morning. That's how many people watch our services. I was in New York last week um, doing a retreat, and the people that were in New York were telling me about what they do on a Sunday morning. If they can't, there's a snowstorm. Out of all the churches in the world, they tune in to this church here in Jacksonville, Florida. So to those that are tuning in and watching our services, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I just encourage all of you as we are about ready to embark on Holy Week that begins tonight, that you would all be part of those services. They are absolutely unbelievable, and we're going to talk about those in a few moments. But I just encourage you to be part. If you want to go to a whole new level in your Holy Week experience, it doesn't happen by accident. you got to come by choice, and I encourage you to be here um, to be with us all throughout this Holy Week. You know, several weeks ago, I began a new sermon series that was entitled From Fasting to Feasting. And the whole premise behind that is that in every single one of us, there is an area of our life that we're struggling with. If you ever came to confession with Father Nick, we had many this morning, I oftentimes tell the people, what's at the tip of your triangle? In other words, what's at the very top of your life that you are struggling with every single day? And every one of us has what the Bible says is a persistent sin. And that's what we spent three weeks talking about, what we needed to be fasting from at the tip of our triangle, and what we need to be feasting on, getting closer to Christ. And today I want to bring that sermon series to a close with a powerful message that I hope inspires every one of you and encourages you in your walk of faith. So let's get started. Today I want to talk to you about defining moments. All of us have had defining moments in our walk of faith. I think back in my own life, Moments that change the trajectory of my life from where I was to who I am right now. Defining moments that catapulted me in my own walk of faith. I remember just a few days before my father would pass away. He would look over at me and say, Nick, take care of that church. Love them. I'm so proud of you. I remember another defining moment for me was when I was with an eight-year-old boy in Kenya, Africa who hadn't had anything to eat for three days. And I had one left last granola bar, and I said to him, hey, eat this granola bar, Samson. And he would take that granola bar and do one of the most defining moments in my own life. He'd break that candy bar apart and go feed, at eight years old, all the little kids in his village. And when I said, why, Samson, did you, did you do that? Why didn't you eat that little candy bar while you had something to eat? And looked over at me, and he said, because we're all family was a defining moment in my life. A defining moment in my life was when Miss Margaret, a beloved member of our church family, who's gone to be with the Lord, one time I was praying over her. She had polio and really unable to physically move. And as I was praying over her, she was, I had my soul on top on her head. And after I was done praying with her, she said, now you stop and let me pray over you. It was a defining moment in my life. And all of us have had those defining moments. And today, church family, you are at one of the most defining moments in the life of Christ. It is called for us Palm Sunday. But let me kind of set for you the setting of what takes place on this defining moment in the life of Christ. He's in a place called Bethany, which is about a couple of miles from Jerusalem. And while he is there, he tells his disciples, two of them, go into the neighboring city, you're going to find a donkey tied to a post. Go untie that donkey from that post, and when the owner of that donkey comes out and says, what are you doing with my donkey? You're going to tell him because the master needs him. And they take that donkey to Christ, they help Christ get on top of that donkey, and then they bring him into the city of Jerusalem. Now you may all wonder why are all the people in Jerusalem, because they are doing what Jews in this country and around the world are doing right now. 
They were celebrating Passover. Almost 1.2 million Jewish people were in Jerusalem at that time. And what they were celebrating was Passover. And many of you may not know what Passover is, but let me just kind of give you a very brief reminder from your Sunday school days that back in the Old Testament, a man named Moses was told by God to go tell the people, go tell Pharaoh, who was named Ramses II, a historical figure, by the way, go tell Ramses II to let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no way. I'm going to keep the Jews imprisoned. And they had been imprisoned, by the way, for over 400 years. And so God sends 10 plagues, plagues like lice, like frogs, like crickets. And then one time he sends a plague and he tells them, he tells Moses to go and put the innocent lamb's blood, take a lamb, slaughter it, and put the blood on the threshold of the door. That way, when the angel of death comes to free you, he will pass over your house and to those who do not have the blood on the lamb on their doorpost, he will take that, he will wipe them out. And what you need to know is that one of the reasons why, by the way, that when we come home after Easter, we put the little candle over our door. It's not because this is a unique to orthodoxy. What we are doing is declaring the Passover, the new Passover that took place when we put the sign of the cross over our doors. And so the people there were celebrating this Passover because God had told Moses after this freedom, after they crossed over the Red Sea, that there are seven major holidays that you're going to have, which by the way, the Jewish people still do to this day, seven major holidays that you will celebrate every year. One of them is to be called Passover, when God freed the Jewish people from the arms of Pharaoh. And so they're all waving their palms today, getting back to this defining moment in the life of Christ. They're all waving their palms because they think that Christ is coming into the city of Jerusalem to free them from not the Egyptians, because they're no longer in control, but the Romans. And they're saying, Hosanna, which literally translates a Hebrew word that means, save us now. And then there are three defining moments that I want to share with you in the life of Christ that I'm telling you, that God may be telling all of us today, come with me today on my defining moments so that I can share with you some defining moments in your life. Maybe, just maybe, that today in your defining moment that Christ is having, that maybe God is saying, you can have it as well. So let me give you three of these defining moments. Here's number one. In Christ's defining moment, he does this. He surrenders for us. Our God surrendered for you. I want you to think about this for a moment. In the Bible, there's two different gardens. There's the Garden of Eden, of Eden that we find in the Old Testament, and then the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Eden, by the way, Adam and Eve are there. You all know that. They end up wanting things to be happening their way. They want things to happen the way they want it to happen. But the Garden of Gethsemane is different. The Garden of Gethsemane is, it's not my way, it's God's way. Because when Christ walks into the Garden of Gethsemane, he tells God, he prays a prayer, God, if you want me to die on that cross and to go through all this, then I will surrender because I love these people. And sometimes in our own life, we too are in two different gardens. Like when we love when God is in our life, like in the Garden of Eden, but we don't like it when he's controlling our life. Like sometimes we are comfortable with telling God, I love the whole part that you're my savior, that you died on the cross for me, but sometimes we can struggle with saying, God, I want you in this part of my life, but don't you dare go in that part of my life. And for many of us, what we need to remember is that God surrendered for us so that we would surrender to him. I had someone tell me the other day, and said, you know, Father Nick, um, they, were going, they had gone through a trial in their life, and they said, you know, Father I just lost, I almost lost my faith in this trial, in this struggle. And I said this totally respectfully, but I told them, thank God you almost lost your faith in that struggle because that's not the faith that you need to have. But let me say it very plainly. A faith that is not tested is a faith that can't be trusted. A faith that can, has not been tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. And for some of us, 
We want to stay in that Garden of Eden. God, you do it this way. Solve it this problem. And what God is saying, can you get out of that garden and get to the Garden of Gethsemane? says, God, whatever you want to take me, I'm willing to follow. It's your way. You're leading my life. It's a defining moment in his life. The second defining moment is this. Is that the defining moment of him sacrificing everything for us. Now listen to me. In the American culture, we oftentimes say that freedom is not free. But can I tell you something? When Christ was on that cross, when he died for our sins, it wasn't free either. And what you all need to know is that when Christ was on that cross, when he declared and was living and decided to die for all of us, what you need to remember is this, is that Christ would endure what is called the cat of nine tails. It's a basically a rod that was the size of a handle. And at the edges of that were these leather strips that had metal, concrete that was shaped, and glass. When Christ was whipped on the cross, he wasn't whipped to beat him. He was, it was yearned to rip his body apart. And he would endure 13 on this right trapezius muscle, 13 on his left. And you should know that that's the purpose of him doing that to separate his neck from his arms. And then they would put on him, not little Home Depot nails, they would put railroad spikes in his arms. And I share this with you because they wouldn't talk about that yet. Then they would put the crown of thorns on his head. And that crown of thorns was placed on his head. It wasn't just kindly put on there. It was shoved on there so much so that it would cause, those of you that have migraines will understand this, will create such an extraordinary pain on the inside of him that he would sweat blood. My encouragement for you to know is that he sacrificed everything for us. Everything he did and what he did for that reason was that he would sanctify us. In other words, what it meant was that I will sacrifice so that you could be sanctified. In other words, that you could become holy. And I'm just encouraging all of you, this church is packed today, and all over the Orthodox world, it's packed in every church. Maybe God is telling you today, you've been at the shallow end of the pool of faith for far too long. You've been at the same area in your walk of faith, at the same three foot in the shallow end of faith, and God is saying, at what point are you going to go a little bit deeper in your walk of faith? At what point are you going to make it a point that every single day I'm going to read about you? Because right now, only 13% of Christians are reading their Bibles, and only 4% of young adults are reading theirs. At what point are you going to make and pray every single day? Because for many of you, prayer is your spare tire, not your steering wheel. He sacrificed to sanctify. And here's number three, is that he surrendered, he sacrificed, and finally, he summons us. Look at me, everyone. Why was a donkey used? Why did God use a donkey? Of all the animals on planet Earth, why a donkey? You want to talk about something extraordinary? Do you know that at every single defining moment in the life of Christ early on, he had a donkey there. It was a donkey that carried Mary from Nazareth into Bethlehem to give birth to Christ. It was a donkey that was inside the cave when Christ was born. And it was a donkey that Christ uses as he navigates through the 1.2 million people in Jerusalem. Why a donkey? Because a donkey was a symbol of peace. It was a symbol of peace. And maybe God is saying, those of you that have problems in your family, maybe God is saying, I need you to be carrying my message of peace in this world. Maybe God is telling some of us that have problems in our marriage, I need to bring a bearer of peace in this world. And maybe for some of us today, God is saying, can you stop holding on to the hurt of the past and start following the peace of the present? Are you allowing his message to be carried through your life. He surrenders, he sacrifices, and he is summoning all of us. I'll leave you with this. 
I love sharing this story because it reminds us so much of how we are in our own life and how this world is constantly distracting us from our life. I've shared this story with you many a times, but I want to remind you about it. It's a story about a guy named John Griffith who lives in Mississippi. And this John Griffith lives there, and he's married, and he has a five-year-old son. And his wife starts complaining one day that, John, that John, you're not spending enough time with our son. Can you take him and spend the day with him? And so John takes his son, his five-year-old son, and he takes him with him to work. Now, what you don't know is that John Griffith works on a railroad train. In fact, he's on a, tr on a railroad track, and he covers this bridge area, and whenever he basically lowers the bridge when the train's coming or raises it when, it's, um, when there's not a train coming. And so that particular day, there was no train coming. John and his son are sitting there having lunch together, eating their little peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And as they're eating their sandwich, John hears a sound of a train coming that wasn't supposed to be coming. John hears it getting closer and closer, and he tells his son, son, you stay right here. Don't leave this area. And so John goes, and he goes to the train area, to the bridge, and climbs up the ladder. As he's climbing up the ladder, he's going to the very top. And as he's on that bridge, about ready to lower the bridge down because he hears the train coming, he looks down onto the train tracks, and he sees in horror his five-year-old son just simply playing on the train. He's right where he would be if he was to lower that train. It would crush him. So he starts yelling at his son, don't stay there, move, move. I've got to lower the bridge. But the son continuously stays down there, not going anywhere. In that moment, the father has to make a decision. He sees this train coming that's filled with passengers on their way there. And he knows that if he lowers the train, he's going to kill his son. But if he doesn't lower it, all 400 people on that train are about ready to die. He has this huge debate on the inside of him. And those of you that are parents, you know what I'm talking about. Could you imagine making a decision between saving a whole bunch of people or saving your child and what you would do? So John Griffith's on there and he sees that train and it's about ready to come on the track, come on that bridge. And he takes that lever, he's going, and he sees his son just having a good time. And he does the unthinkable. He lowers the bridge. And it crushes his son. And the train goes over and over and over on this five-year-old boy. And he's sitting there seeing this happen. And he comes down off the ladder. He wants to get to his son, but the train keeps coming. So he peeks into the window of the train as the people are going over. And he sees people. One lady is filing her nails. Another gentleman is drinking his tea. Another woman is reading the newspaper. And he's watching all this happening. And he starts to cry unbelievably, profusely. At the end, after the body has been mangled and destroyed, he holds his son. And at that same time, the news captor, casters are coming there. And the news anchor asks him, John, how could you have done that? How could you have sacrificed your son? And John looks into the camera and he says something that changes my life and hopefully will be a defining moment in your life. He says, I can't believe that I lost my son. He says, but you know what hurts me the most? Is that as I was looking in those trains as they were coming one after the other, the people had no idea what I had just done for them. They had no idea how much I had sacrificed my only son so that they could live. Could it be, church family, that we are in the train called life and we're just watching it go by day after day, not having any idea what Christ did for you? He didn't have two sons. He had just one, and he gave him to you. He saved your life and my life at the expense of his son. And I'm just encouraging you all to go out today to remember that today can be a defining moment in your life. He surrendered for us. He sacrificed everything for us. And he is summoning us to bring a message of peace to this world. 
Christ experienced the absolute worst on earth in a moment so that you and I can experience the best of the kingdom of heaven for eternity. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for downloading this message. I hope that in some small way, this sermon can inspire you, motivate you, and guide you in your walk of faith. I'm a firm believer, friends, in what I like to call practical Christianity, basically trying my best to give you some steps and some tips that you can follow to apply this sermon in your everyday walk of faith. And so if you have found this sermon beneficial, do me a favor. Not only do I want you to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, where you get access to all of our sermons, but I also want you to share them with your family and your friends. Let's go out and make a difference in this world, and hopefully this sermon can be one way that we do just that. I also want you to stay in touch with us all throughout the week on our social media platforms. Friends, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook and Twitter, all under the headings of The Lows. And this past year, Roxanne and I started sending out these daily inspirational messages. And if you would like to receive those messages, go to our website at thelows.com forward slash subscribe. And all you have to do is simply put up your email address and every day at 7 a.m., you'll receive one of our daily words of encouragement. And finally, friends, if I can ever be of assistance to you, do me a favor, you can stay in touch with me by going and emailing me at fathernicholas at thelows.com. That's fathernicholas at thelows.com. Once again, everyone, thanks so much for downloading this message. God bless you and stay strong in your walk of faith.